Good to see you guys. I have a question for you, okay? I want you to be honest. How, or better yet, would you describe yourself as a patient person? <laughs> okay, by the laughter, <laughs> I'm assuming you feel kind of like me. Maybe I don't even need to ask your spouse or your children, but they would be honest. They would tell you, are you known to be a person <laughs> of patience? No. Yeah, I know, right? Thank you for the honesty. No. It is a fruit of the Spirit, right? right? I tell you what, most of us grew up all our lives saying, well, patience is a virtue. Patience is a virtue. But you know what? That's false. That's not really true. Just ask Dwight Schrute. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a virtue. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And as followers of Jesus, we are supposed to, Galatians, right? We are supposed to be embodying the fruit of the Spirit. So how come people are so stinking short on patience. People are angry. Have you noticed that? Everybody's so mad. Just stand in line somewhere, you know, at whether it's a restaurant that is way too understaffed, can't get help. drive throughs good night. Just this week, we're sitting there. I'm like, I could pull up. My order's completely wrong, like totally wrong. I'm like, no, it's not that. I can't drink that. What is, what is going on? You know what happened? The people in front of me, by the time we ordered and they paid, they bailed. They left. So I'm getting their order. Now the car behind me is getting, it was like, it was like chaos. Dogs and cats living together. It was weird. People are so angry. You know, it, it, it didn't used to always be this way. But I remember as a kid, you know, being able to look up certain people with patience. And if I'm being honest, I bet they had their bouts of impatience. I remember as a youngling, something would go wrong with the car. And dad, back then, you could fix the cars, right? You could tune them, you could tweak them, you could listen to the carburetor and the little thingy thing and all that stuff. Technical term. I remember late in the night hearing like hammering and stuff going on in the garage and wrenches dropping down inside and hearing my dad rip it, snip it, rip it up. And like you're just praying like please don't come inside and get help. You don't need me. Don't get me. And sure enough that door would open. He'd say, you, I need your help. You're like, okay. You know, and I can't do anything. I don't know anything about cars. You know, you're 11. You know, what do you do? What's your job? Hold the flashlight. Yes, son, you got it. Hold the flashlight. In fact, I think we have an actual photo of me and my dad <laughs> holding, holding the flashlight. This is a true story. It's 1977, but I've recovered. If you are needing patience, you are in the right place. Today, God's word has a word for us. If you've ever found yourself out of patience, and you can kind of sense that maybe you're at your wit's end, you ever try to do the right thing and just kind of bail, just disappear? And you're like, I just, before I explode on you, I'm just going to get away. And so you have that secret place. Maybe it's the beach for some of us. And you want to go and you just want to get away because it's just too people-y out there. And right now, if I'm being honest, I don't like people. So what happens? You go to that special place, you're out on the beach, and you find there's people there too. And these facial expressions <laughs> represent the four phases of having somebody in your perfect spot. And you are there, and you're so fired up, you're like, I'm going to get along with God. And it turns out there's people there, and you're out of patience. So if that is you, you are in the right place. Welcome back for week two of Into the Wilderness. Last week, you heard a little bit about the wilderness concept in Scripture, and the not-so-fun concept of being tested, maybe even being tried in the wilderness. And we learned that even Jesus had a season in the wilderness where he was tested. And remember, Satan came to him. He tried his best to trap him into temptation and lead him into sin. However, Jesus stood firm on the word. And every time the devil came to him with a different temptation, what was Jesus' response? Mm, that's not right. This is it. He quoted scripture. He was able to retaliate with everything, even correcting Satan once when he butchered Psalm 91. And he was able to sit there and say, that's not true. It is written this. Y'all, and then we learned another lesson, right? In order for you to be able to quote it, you got to know it. Huh? If you want to quote it, you got to know it. How you doing with that? Is this the only meal you eat all week long? <laughs> Whew, you're starving. If that's it, this can't be the only meal. This cannot be the only time you dive into this book. We have to be people of the book. The wilderness, God's word says otherwise. It says there is no temptation that has seized you except such as common to man. 
What you're going through, he's going through. What she's going through, she's going through. We have been, and we have a Savior who has been through everything. He's not aloof. He's not far off. He came. He put flesh on. And he was able to deal with temptation just like you and I. This morning we're going to look at a whole different story about being patient in the wilderness. And what makes it so hard today is we live in a world where we want everything. And when do we want it? Now. now. We want it now. And this little gadget right here doesn't help. You know why? Because with just a few little little tappy taps, you can have everything you want. And it can literally show up magically, like in two days. Or if you have Amazon Prime, I don't know what witchcraft that is. Man, that thing, it arrives in like eight minutes. It's weird. Amy can hit like, do, 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 send, and the doorbell rings. It's, it's creepy. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, one of you sent me or showed me this, this great meme, and uh, it's so true about shipping. Here's the UPS. Your package is in your city. It's on a truck driven by Mike. It will arrive on your doorstep by 627 today. That's pretty good. Step down a little bit. FedEx. Your package is coming. You'll get it when we get it there, right? There's the United States Postal Service. <laughs> what package? <laughs> Amazon, we're already inside your apartment. Check the bathroom, right? It's so creepy, but it's so true. And then Facebook, <laughs> we know you were thinking about getting a toaster yesterday. Here's 20 ads for a toaster. <laughs> the truth is, guys, this is emblematic of a, we don't like to wait. But as Christians, we're not called to be like the world. We're not supposed to blend in. We're supposed to, y'all, what if there is wisdom in the waiting. What if there's wisdom in the waiting? And we're missing it because we hate to wait. But there's a reason for God's waiting room. And we may not like it, but today we dive into the Old Testament here. Go ahead and find 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24. By the way, if you're new to the faith, welcome. It's great to have you, even if you're checking us out online. This is in the Old Testament. It's a little closer to the front of your Bible than the middle if you're looking for it. It's page 405 in mine. If that helps you at all. <laughs> We're going to look at two key historical figures, Saul and David. And I want to set the context for what we're looking at here because context is so important. It's so easy to lift stuff out of context. People do it all the time. But they mean well, but here's what's happening. David has already been chosen to be the next king of Israel. Okay? He's already been anointed. God has declared him. There's just one problem. Saul is still the king. So Saul's in that position. So Saul is kind of nervous about David. He's aware of this. He's heard what's coming. And so Saul, kind of feel like David's aiming for a spot, takes matters in his own hands and says, you know what? I'm going to hunt David down and I'm going to kill him. So he's pretty aggressive. That's where our story picks up in verse 1 of that pursuit, okay? First Samuel 24, look at verse 1, New King James Version. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told to him saying, hey, take note, David's over there. He's in the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel. Okay, pause there. There's a hidden gem. The fact that Saul took 3,000, not just men, the choicest men, the fact that he took 3,000 men should be an alarm bell to you. That shows you his paranoia because that is five times the amount David had in the cave. He took five times the amount. And he shows up. Okay, keep reading. He says, he went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. Cool name. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to, <laughs> to attend to his needs. Okay, that's a nice way of saying it's bathroom time. David and his men were staying in that cave, though. They're further into the cave, hiding in the, in the recesses of the cave. Verse 4. Then the men of David, apparently they're seeing Saul. They hear, they know what's coming. And they say to David, this is the day. He's right there. This is the day the Lord was talking. Behold, I will deliver the enemy into your hand so you can do to him as it seems good to you. So David arose and he secretly comes up and he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. Okay, evidently Saul's not wearing the robe at this point. He's taking it off to take care of stuff. Maybe it's hiding on a rock. I don't know. He comes over and he cuts. This is huge, by the way. This means something. We'll get to that in a minute. There's a hidden gem right there. He cuts off this part of the robe and then it happens that not long after this, patience is what gives you proper perspective. Much of this life has to do with viewing your situation through a specific lens. Every one of us have a lens, whether it's a worldly lens, a secular lens, a godly lens. In fact, raise your hand if you wear contacts or glasses. 
How many people? Okay, so at least half this room, my goodness, this room's packed. At least half of this room is wearing some kind of lens, okay? If your perspective is off, it distorts what you're seeing. Do you remember as a kid, you'd be driving down the road, maybe you take off your little nerdy glasses like I had, and like suddenly Christmas lights became these big color blobs? Like, like, oh, look, it's so pretty, you know? It's like, what? And like, you put your glasses back on, the first time you got glasses, you're like, there's individual leaves on trees? What is that, right? But maybe you're tired and you, you trust your spouse to drive, you know, right? Late through the night, careful. I hear you, I hear you, baby. <clears throat> True story. You trust her because she's awesome at everything. So you're driving and like, you, you, you take your glasses off a little bit, you put the seat back just a little. And you're kind of dozing, like the soft music's playing, the kids are not fighting, they're in the back seat, and you're like, all is right with them. I'm expecting like a Disneyland Blue Jay to come land on my shoulder and sing me a tune. Everything is right with the world. You look out, you're kind of in this hazy, not quite asleep, not quite awake, and you see like the majestic moon that the Lord has painted, and it's just kind of out of focus. Then you put your glasses on, you realize, that's no moon. <laughs> that's Burger King, right? Lenses matter. When you put your glasses on, guys, it changes your view. This is our lens. God's word is the lens. But if we're never in it, we don't know it. And we can't look through the world. We can't look at the news. We can't look at current events unless we know the proper lens. When we put it on, look how crisp everything gets. Anybody hungry for a Whopper, right? Look how crisp this is. It changed. Lenses matter. Much of life has to do with viewing your situation through the right lens. And this includes your waiting. I'm not talking to somebody. You are in the wilderness now. When David chooses to see Saul's pursuit through a specific lens, it changed what he did. Remember, everyone's aware. The Bible tells us David already was anointed the next king of Israel. And now God was inviting him to wait. You know why? Because his time had not yet come. Even though his friends were cheering him on. David could have easily killed Saul, and he probably could have justified it. Think about this. Knowing Saul was trying to kill him, the Bible clearly says he's had an opportunity to do so. Here it is. When he cuts off that part of the robe, this shows beyond any doubt how close he came. He could have easily killed him. But here's the thing. When a man cuts off another man's robe, it is meant to be a sign of public humiliation. It is the ultimate degradation. But when a king cuts the robe of another king, do you know what it meant back then? It meant your kingdom is defeated. I am king. Your days are over. It literally meant there's a new sheriff in town. And so when he did this, immediately he regrets it. David knew what this meant. You know, but he had his friends right there. Look at the response that he said in verse 6. He says, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed. The Lord himself has chosen him. In a little bit, that's going to be me. If I do this and usurp it, you know, David even restrained his men and wouldn't allow them to rise up against him. Do you want to talk about bold? David had all these men. These were brothers in arms, men who would die for him, saying, David, there he is. The Lord has delivered him into your hands. He's right there. God's put him. You got it. Let's go. They probably flexed and like, come on. He's right there. This, you, you, you. Don't forget, he becomes king. All of them rise up too. They knew what this meant, and he was right there. The battle would be over before it even begun. And David stands up to his own men, risking their ridicule. Don't miss that. Risking the ridicule. He's the anointed. If, if there has ever been someone who had a right to revenge, it was David. Think about this. He was the anointed of the Lord. He was already appointed to succeed Saul to the throne of Israel. He had done nothing but faithfully serve Saul. Nothing. He had been nothing but awesome. In fact, he even did Saul's heavy lifting. When Saul was fluttering around, Goliath was coming out taunting Israel. And David's like, you're letting this uncircumcised Philistine insult us like this? What? Give me some stone. Give me some stone. Right? Remember what he does? He goes out. Well, bam. Boom. And he falls down. But that's not what killed him. Read the next scripture. It says he didn't have a sword. So he went and he took Goliath's sword. And with that, whoom, he decapitated him. Cut his head off right there. That just goes to show that David was a man who knew how to get ahead. 
Sorry. Sorry. That's terrible. If it's not at least one bad pun, in a, it doesn't count. Think about this. He did his heavy lifting. He did all this stuff. He says, I am going to kill you. You are now the object of my wrath. My Jeremiah study Bible points out, says this. Yet through all this, David did not allow Saul's actions or attitudes of his men to persuade his heart or change his behavior. Did you catch that? No matter what someone does with our mercy, no matter how nice we've been, we have to make sure our hearts are always right before the Lord. You know what that means? That can mean extending grace to people who are hard to love. Those people who are as cuddly as a cactus, have the personality of a sunburn, you know what I'm talking about. Everyone has one in their life. And you're just like, oh, they're just so hard to love. Because God loves us that way. Never forget, you expect grace from the Lord. We need to be able to give grace to others. We are called to do that. Man, it is hard. Y'all, that is serious Christianity. How are you doing with that? You see, David gained in the waiting what many of us are here today wanting, and that is proper perspective. Don't you want to see things through God's point of view? I wonder what kind of wilderness you're in today. Maybe as we talked last week, you're in the wilderness because you're getting tested. It's a time of trials. You don't understand what's going on. Listen, it is not always a bad thing to be tested in the wilderness. We see this. It wasn't a bad thing for Jesus. God used that for a purpose. Maybe you're running from something like David was. Hiding out in a cave? Kind of scared? Not sure what to do? Maybe you're wandering around <clears throat> without a purpose. Maybe you keep going back to that sin that keeps bringing you back down that you just can't seem to break those chains. Maybe you don't know why you're in the wilderness. And maybe your mission is simply to be there in the cave waiting patiently on the Lord, waiting for him to do what he needs to do in his timing. Ooh, we don't like that part. We don't like to wait on his timing. Be honest, right? We want it. We want it now. Do you see what's happening here? While Saul is pursuing David, David is pursuing God. That's deep. That's what I want. While my enemies are coming after me, I want to be so focused on God, I don't care what they say. I know my heart before the Lord. You know your heart before the Lord. I want to be so consumed with him that all this other noise doesn't even matter. And God's calling us to this level of holiness. As the days get darker, and they will, until the Lord returns, we know the ending. We know where this is headed. We don't lose hope. We are the hope. We carry this. But we have to struggle to strive to meet the Lord, to live in a way that is holy and pleasing to him. See, David was so consumed with his heavenly father. We re repeatedly read that he, he brings his needs and his struggles and his, Lord, well, how long? And, and he pours out his heart, and he's allowing God to meet him right there in the middle of his struggles. So this is huge. This is a lesson that will help every one of you today. The more time we spend with God, the greater our perspective will be. So maybe today it is your day in the middle of the wilderness. In order to gain the perspective you want, it is time to lean into him, to exercise patience. The word of God is what helps us do that. To gain the proper perspective, you have to dedicate time to reading it and meditating on it. But once David gained this perspective, he had to learn another lesson. You ready for this? And that's this. Patience requires perseverance. Ooh. Patience gives. Perseverance, mm, that's often what patience requires. You want patience? It's going to require perseverance. Maybe you're thinking, well, how was David persevering in this story. It seemed like he already made up his mind. He knew he didn't want to kill Saul. Well, I would argue to that. His perseverance was one internally. He was constantly having to decide not to harm Saul. See, this was not the only time Saul was in his grasp. We forget that. But just two chapters later, guess what happens? Saul's men are out there. and They come up to King Saul and they say, hey, are you looking for there? So again, Saul chooses 3,000 of the best men of Israel to go find him. And he goes and he seeks David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul camps on this hill right across from where David is rumored to be hiding. All right? And that's where we pick up our story in verse 6. Check it out of, of chapter 26. So David arose 
And he came to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay. Okay, so he's on this mountain. He's looking down. He could see Saul's whole army. He sees Abner, he's the commander, the general of the army. Now Saul lay within the camp, and his people are encamped all around him. This is common. They surround the king, okay, so that you can't get to him. This is so ironic what's about to happen. So his people are encamped around him. Verse 6, David answers and says to Halimelech the Hittite and Abishai the son of Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, he says, hey, who will go down with me? So David, Abishai, I love Abishai. I'll go, I'll go. You all know that guy? Pick me, pick me, pick me. I love Abishai. He's so overeager. He's a spaz. You know, I identify with this guy. I love it. So David and Abishai go. They come to the people by night, okay? So they're sneaking down there, and Saul lays there asleep within the camp. He's got a spear stuck in the ground by his head. This was common. This is what you did. When you went to sleep and you were a warrior, you left your weapon right beside you so you could get it. When you wake up, you're like, what's that? Right? You grab your staff, grab your spear, grab your sword. That's why that's there, in case you're wondering. That's a weird thing to us. We don't, hopefully you don't have a spear by your head. So Abner and the people are laying all around him. Verse 8. Then Abishai says to David, he did it again. God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him. Let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth. I will pin him to the ground, is what he's saying. I won't have to do it a second time. Check out David's response. But David says to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? That's an awesome translation because it's literal. It's a word for word. Here's the thought for thought rendition of that from the message. Same verse. Look at verse 7. So David and Abishai entered the encampment by night, and there he was, Saul, stretched out asleep in the center of the camp. Can you picture it? And the spear is stuck in the ground near his head with Abner, there's the general, and the troops sound asleep on all sides, okay? So they've circled around Saul, okay? And Abishai, they sneak in, they have to, they have to be whispering in this one. They come up and say, David, this is your moment. God has put your enemy in your grasp. Let me nail him to the ground with a spear. Please let me do it. One hit will do it. Please, please, please. Can you hear how excited he is? He's still saying, let me kill him. Let me, let me, let me kill him. Please, <laughs> let me kill him. Look at David's response. David says to Abishai, don't you dare hurt him. Who could lay a hand on God's anointed and even think of getting away with it? So you have the exact same situation we just saw in chapter 24. The exact same situation. David once again has the opportunity to take Saul's life. So clearly, he has to practice patience. And he has to do it on more than one occasion. And it requires perseverance. If you've ever been there, you know exactly what he's going through. We have examples of this. Just look in your past. It was hard for me way back in the 80s. I can't imagine what it was like for you to stand up for what you believe when people mock you, to stand up against bullying, stand up against peer pressure, all these people being like, whoa, because everybody, I know. Just relax, Christian. Just go with the flow. Why? You're so uptight about this Jesus stuff. You act like he died for you or something. Yeah. Yeah. He, he kind of did. And I gave him my heart and I surrendered. And I said, if you died for me, the least I can do is live for you. Y'all, that takes perseverance. That takes perseverance to stand up. In David's case, the men around him in both scenarios, they thought killing Saul would be the right thing to do. Don't miss that. In fact, they even use scripture. They're like, this is in line with God's will. It is God's will. He has put him in your hand. Kill him now. Does that, does that strike anybody else as weird? This is it. This is your time. Kill the man. They said that. And David rejected it. He persevered. He refused. He went against the crowd. Don't miss this. David's closeness with God and his word allowed him to understand on the deepest level God's own heart. And it wouldn't be long before David would be labeled a man after God's own heart. Man, I want to be known as that. Don't you? I want to be known as a man after... God's own heart. And God's own heart right here was to allow Saul to live a little longer. It wasn't to take it. It was about his timing. All right? So let's bring this into your world today. How does this apply? Are there people in your life right now who are whispering advice to you? Maybe sharing their wisdom. Maybe they even mean well. Maybe they even think that they're giving you the... And you know, if I did, it, you know, it wouldn't be terrible if I acted on their advice. 
but yet you know in your heart it's just not the best scenario. It may be good, but it's not the best. I think David wrestled with that internally, just like we do. We wrestle with these questions and these feelings. And each time we have to persevere internally, wrestling through those same thoughts and feelings. We have to be willing to say no to the... Do we like silence? Do we like being silent before the Lord? If we did, we'd, we'd do it more. David knew ultimately his patience would come from following God at all costs, at all times. If we're able to do this, guys, if we're able to grow in patience due to our closeness to the Lord, we will see the same thing David was able to see in response to that closeness. We'll see patience. We'll be able to discern God's best. So where are you today? Are you at a fork in the road? Maybe you've got a choice. Maybe you've got a career thing going on. Maybe you've got a house situation going on. Maybe you've got a family issue that you're wrestling. Maybe a medical issue, and you're at a fork in the road. Or maybe you've got several roads that you could choose from, and you're looking at this today and going, God, I, I need to hear from you. I need to know. Maybe you've got some people whispering in your ear, good advice. But in your heart, the Holy Spirit is saying, that's not the best. We have to be able to discern that. What if it wasn't the best result that God wanted? Here's the bottom line for today, okay? As we come in and bring in us all, this is the core truth, okay? This is the truth that no one really wants to hear if we're honest. Often, God's best for our lives is found in the waiting. That's a good one. Y'all need to take a picture of that and write that down. Often God's best for our lives is found in the waiting. Could it be the reason we don't follow God's best for our lives is because we're not willing to do the second part? We're not willing to wait? What do we want to do? We kick the door down. I'm coming in. Nobody likes to wait. Nobody likes to do that. We want to kick the door down and go. There's a great meme that I saw years ago that goes something like this. When you're sitting in God's waiting room, until God opens the next door, praise him in the hallway. Isn't that great? Till God opens that, don't kick the door down. What if that door's not meant for you? So praise him in the hallway. Stay faithful. Nobody likes waiting. I remember Isaiah 40. We love this. Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to soar on wings like eagles. I'm going to run and not grow weary. I'm going to walk and not faint. So, Y'all, we forget. We misquote this verse because there's one word in here that talks about it. Can you see it? It says, young men will stumble and fail, but those who wait, those who what? Wait on the Lord. We forget that. There's the qualifier. They're the ones that renew their strength. It is not easy to be patient, and it is not a lot of fun to wait. I get it. But the Lord renews our strength in the waiting. Are you tired? Are you out of patience? The noise. And bask in his presence. That's where we find the strength we need to persevere. To quote the great Old Testament prophet, Axelus Rosicus. All we need is a little patience. You got to look for him. He's in second hesitations. It's in the Old Testament. All we need is a little patience. Regardless of what scenario you find yourself in right now, every one of us is tempted to take matters into our own hands. This is what we do. God, you're not moving fast enough. Allow me to help. <laughs> right? I prayed. I had the opportunities to learn patience. I don't want that. I want the actual patience. Can we skip to the end of the line, right? I've got plenty of opportunities to exercise. I, just give me patience, right? But we laugh because it's what we do. But until we can acknowledge that and be honest with each other before the Lord, you know, it is so easy to want the quick fix to our problem. We want immediate results. And why would a toaster ad waiting on me? Right? Everything we want, just to, just to click away. It, it, it's, it's bombarded us. We, we are an immediate culture. But I believe today, through this story of David, God wants to rewire how we think about the wilderness. I'll be honest, when I hear the word wilderness, God's going to take me to the wilderness. I'm not happy about that. I don't want to go to the wilderness. But if it's for my good to grow me, to make me more like Jesus, I need to be able to do it. It's the bottom line. If I want to be more like Christ, I have to follow what he did. And he went to the wilderness. He desires for us to be patient, even when it's uncomfortable. Even when he may be, when it seems like people are giving us the advice we want, and, well, this is what we've been praying for. Kill him. He's right here. He's in his hands. We can have almost anything we want so immediately. But what if God is in the waiting? David had a chance to kill Saul multiple times. 
But he's patient, and he recognizes that God will be the one to bring him to the throne in his father's time, not in David's time. And sometimes in the wilderness, I know it's hard to wait, but never forget this. You want to write this down. God's timing is always better than ours. Always. Do you believe that? Because how we live will answer that question. God's timing is always better than ours. So my question for us today, what if he tells you to wait? Are you willing to wait? Man, that's hard. I get it. Are you willing to wait for God's best rather than settle for something that's good? Because that's what we do all day long. We settle for the quicker thing. We take the shortcut, the easy route. But what if the learning is coming and it's not easy? We confess that it is, it is hard. It is hard in our flesh. We, we want to go. It doesn't come naturally to us. We want to have everything and have it now. Lord, would you forgive us for that? Help us to be so focused on you that the noise of the world is an afterthought. Help us to learn that your waiting room is not punishment. You're, you're showing us what's best. God, would you give us patience? Even if it means opportunities to learn patience, Lord, we ask for it. We need it. God, help us to stand out in a world that is so impatient, so angry, so self-absorbed. Help us to be different. Help us to exude the fruit of the Spirit. May people see a difference in us. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a first-timer here and I see a lot of new faces, what we like to do at the end, this is kind of the high, the, the high mark of, of the service, the climax. We like to open the altar and sing a final song of worship to the Lord. This is where we cement our, our commitment. If God's been speaking to you, sometimes we'll open up the altar and you can come pray. No one will bother you. We, we love to do that. And maybe you want to come and just take your faith to the next level. Maybe you just want to take a moment and kneel at the altar and surrender and say, God, don't let me move until you've accomplished what you want in me. That's a bold prayer. Don't let me move out of your waiting room until you've accomplished what you want in the waiting. Maybe today you're, you've been a believer, but you've kind of drifted away, or you want to come back to the Lord. You want to rededicate your life. Or maybe you want to take the next step in your faith journey and be baptized. This past Wednesday night at Refuel, midweek Bible study, we weren't even talking about it. We had five amazing people come up to me after church. Five on a cold Typical Wednesday night. We weren't even talking about it. Three adults and two children. One right after that come up. It was amazing. Y'all, God is moving. When you see the world kind of start to fade away and you see church attendance down across the world, there's a remnant that he is raising up of people who are sold out. I want to be counted among those. And maybe God is saying, you know what? You've never made that public declaration. Maybe you want to come up after church and tell the pastor, I'm ready to take the next step and make my faith public. We're going to be doing that in a few weeks, and you can join this group. Maybe you feel like you're in God's waiting room, and you want to come pray for patience. You want to come pray for wisdom. Ask for his perfect will. God, what is your will for me? What is your will for my family? What is your will for my career? Would you show me? If I need to wait, Lord, show me that. So whatever God is leading you to do today, be obedient. Just be obedient. He is here, and his word has spoken. Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. Just be obedient to what God is asking you to do. You come as the Lord leads.